Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here today. It's good to be with Treasurer Pichek and many other partners to talk about a new important tool in our housing toolbox, which the Treasurer will discuss in a few minutes. It's no secret that Vermont faces significant challenges, and housing is a big one. We've been focused on the lack of affordable housing since my first term in office when we worked with the legislature and created a $37 million housing bond which leveraged hundreds of millions more in private investment, making it, at the time, the largest housing investment in state history. Then a few years later, when we first received federal dollars uh, during the pandemic, I made it clear housing needed to be a top priority. And we again worked with the legislature to secure hundreds of millions of dollars more. In my time as governor, we've seen a historic level of housing construction and more new units coming online than we've seen in decades. But we know it's still nowhere near enough, especially considering the recent flooding. The initiative the Treasurer will talk about in a minute is another helpful step, which will support housing for critical income levels, affordable units, workforce housing, missing middle, and upgrades for some flood-impacted communities. As we make record investments, I've also made this point. This isn't just a money problem. We need more regulatory relief, too. I've been pushing for desperately needed reform, including to Act 250, when I was in the Senate as Lieutenant Governor and as my time as Governor uh, for the last seven years. We did take some important steps this year with S-100, but we need more. But I want to thank those here, including legislators and housing partners who worked hard on that bill. As another example, when the legislature came back to session in June, I provided a list of suggestions, including moving up the implementation date for S-100, and almost all of them were accepted. Another helpful step forward. That goes to show when we focus on the issues that actually uh, help Vermonters and not get distracted by politics, we can make a difference. Initiatives like the one that we're here to talk about today will continue to move the needle. And I want to thank the Treasurer and his team for their collaboration with mine and for his focus on this issue. If we all pull in the same direction on housing, we can continue to make progress. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner, or, or, sorry, Treasurer Pichet. Old habits. <laughs> Old habits. <laughs> Thanks, Governor. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for being here uh, this morning. Um, you know, I think all of us in the room uh, have a story to tell on housing, whether that story is for ourselves, a close family member, a friend, you know, who have recently struggled to find housing uh, in Vermont. Uh, I know when I talk to businesses all across Vermont, uh, they talk about uh, housing being their number one challenge. They talk about how they'd like to expand their business, how they would like to bring on new clients, uh, but they can't do that because they can't find the workforce because their potential employees can't find housing. And it's the same story when you talk to organizations that provide critical services to our communities. Hospitals can't hire nurses, te schools can't hire teachers, first responders can't hire new recruits because all of those individuals are unable to find housing in the communities that they would like to serve. And as the governor pointed out, the July flooding has only exacerbated this problem for hundreds of Vermonters that are now trying to find permanent long-term housing, which is unavailable. That's why I'm so excited to be able to make the announcement today. Uh, this $55.5 million investment that comes from our office will leverage an estimated $340 million of additional capital that will all together support over 1,100 units of new housing throughout Vermont. I want to first thank our Treasurer's Office staff for their excellent work uh, in expanding this program and identifying projects to support and making sure those projects were strong and the organizations that we are investing in have a strong financial track record as well. Uh, Vermonters can be rest assured that their tax money will be well protected uh, while also earning a return and getting the economic impact of more housing throughout uh, the state. I also want to thank the governor and his administration, specifically Josh Hanford, uh, also Gus Selig, Sarah Waring, 
uh, the LIAC committee for their help in identifying projects for us to invest in. It was critical to have their support and expertise as we wanted to find the best projects that would have the biggest impact. All of this money is coming out of our 10% in Vermont program. This is a program that the legislature established that allows the treasurer to invest up to 10% of the state's cash on hand into economic development uh, and job creation. Uh, we identified very early uh, in our term that housing was the number one economic issue our state was facing. And I was glad to uh, see that the uh, local investment advisory committee that advises us on these matters agreed with us in that regard. Also, because we've had a tremendous increase in the amount of cash on hand as a state, we were able to expand this program significantly, which makes the capacity that we have today to make these critical investments. These investments are in the way of low interest loans to the projects and low interest loans at this moment in time with historically high interest rates are a critical way of continuing to support housing uh, even though interest rates make that a real challenge at the current moment. In terms of the projects that we are supporting, I'm also very excited about that in terms of, of a portfolio. You mentioned, you heard from the governor that this is going to support housing across the entire spectrum. For example, the $50 million that will go to the Vermont Finance Housing Agency, $14 million will be set aside for traditional affordable housing. $14 million will be set aside for economic impact housing that will support employers that are looking to expand housing for their workforce. Six million will be set aside for small and emerging developers who are looking to serve underserved communities, including rural communities across Vermont. Six million will be set aside for flood resiliency and uh, sustainability as we look to recover from the July flooding. Five million will be set aside for home ownership and another five million will be set aside specifically for manufactured homes. And we'll hear from more Collins in a minute with more details on their uh, proposal. Additionally, we'll spend $5 million with the Vermont Economic Development Authority, which will go on to support a project in Virgens that is an assisted living facility that will expand that capacity of that unit to 65 additional beds focused on low and moderate income seniors. So this is a critical investment as well. Not only will it provide 65 more beds for a population that we need to support, but the hope is that it also has a ripple effect through the community as individuals and seniors that are looking for assisted living facilities leave their homes and make them available for others, including young families. And then last, a $500,000 investment with the Northern Forest Center to support a project in St. Johnsbury that will take a home that, or take a building that at the moment uh, is underutilized, has no apartments and very limited commercial space, and transform it into a nine-unit apartment building with two and three bedroom units, which are in critical need across the state, uh, with also two commercial units as well. And this is a project and an investment in right in downtown St. Johnsbury, which we're also very excited about. And beyond these economic benefits that we'll surely see from this investment, you know, we also know that uh, one of the uh, major social issues facing our state is in terms of the lack of housing is its exacerbation of homelessness, uh, challenges around serving uh, effectively mental health and substance use disorder treatment, uh, and that one of the main drivers of homelessness are a low vacancy rate and a high median rent in a particular community. And unfortunately in Vermont, we have some of the lowest vacancy rates and some of the highest median rents in the country. So more housing is needed to make sure we can stabilize and bring down the cost of housing uh, and solve these social issues as well in the long run. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Maura Collins uh, from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Maura? Thank you. Hi, as the treasurer said, I'm Maura Collins. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. VHFA is almost a 50-year-old organization um, that has existed with a mission of furthering affordable housing throughout the state of Vermont through supporting homeowners as well as renters. This award of $50 million from the 10% for Vermont program is going to support just over 1,000 units of housing, 1,000 homes in Vermont. About two-thirds of those will be dedicated to rental housing that will be cover a range of rents and incomes of people served. So 
Some of this will go to support traditional affordable rental housing, such as folks or places that can rent for about, I'll say $1,100 for a um, two bedroom, I'm sorry, one bedroom apartment. And then in addition, there's also, we've heard from employers and municipalities about the need to support market rate rental housing. So this would be a one bedroom apartment, maybe renting for $2,500. And through the loan dollars that VHFA will be able to give to developers and builders, we hope that we can expand the housing market and expand more of these rental units. About 100 of those apartments we anticipate through our traditional affordable rental programs will serve those who are exiting homelessness. So it's a broad spectrum of who we're trying to address here. The other third of the units will go toward home ownership that may be an expansion of a really successful middle income homeownership development program where we have been funding at VHFA using state resources, creating affordable starter homes. But a lot of that probably is also gonna go to support infrastructure of homeownership. And the way it used to work back in the day, many decades ago, was that communities would often have the resources to put in the sewer, the water, the lighting, the sidewalks, all the infrastructure needed. And then developers would come and just build the homes. And communities were welcoming of the development because they knew that those residents and those workers would revitalize that community. But budgets get tighter and times change and now those infrastructure costs that used to be borne by municipalities no longer can be paid for by those stretched thin budgets and so those costs get pushed on to developers and so by investing in that kind of infrastructure that can create an environment for housing development we can make housing more affordable because those costs don't get pushed on to the buyers of those homes Included in these investments are investments also in infrastructure and residents of manufactured home communities or mobile homes. They are a combination of homeowners who often have rented lots in co-op and nonprofit housing communities, and so we plan to support them with this investment as well. The money is going to be adaptable and responsive to market needs. It might flex a bit between the home ownership and rental and the types of loan products that we're talking about. But as the treasurer laid out, we have six different investment areas and terms that we're looking at. But we need to be responsive. The flooding in July taught us that especially. So we are setting aside some of the funding so that we can make sure that we have flood resiliency and sustainable um, programs going forward. So VHFA's role here would be what it's been for the past 50 years. We will structure the programs that this money um, will fund, we'll take in the applications, we'll perform the due diligence, we'll do the underwriting and issue the loan commitments. We anticipate that this money will start to be deployed within the next few months and that would all be in the ground being put to use uh, over the next two to three years. The treasurer laid out the funding um, and how it's gonna support traditional affordable housing, market rate rentals, um, small and emerging developers doing small deals that can be the kind of infill development that we often see, especially in our rural areas. Um, there's going to be support for home ownership, manufactured housing, and I mentioned the flood resiliency. So these investments are going to rely on and par help us partner with banks and credit unions and lenders so that we can leverage other resources. Because $50 million, as much as I very much appreciate it, is not going to solve our housing crisis right now. But we need more tools in the toolbox because this housing crisis is impacting all of us. It's impacting those who are trying to leave the hotel motel programs. It's impacting our flooded manufactured home residents. It's impacting renters who are trying um, to find a place to live, new Vermonters, homeowners, who are, um, and those trying to become homeowners. And it's impacting employers and communities that are trying to grow. So um, 
We anticipate that we will be able to take this money and launch these programs very quickly, utilizing um, a lot of the infrastructure that's already in place and are very excited about this opportunity. Next, I'd like to invite up the Commissioner of Housing, Josh Hanford. Thanks, Maura. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, Treasurer Pichak. I don't have a lot of remarks to add to this program other than just to say, anytime we talk about more resources to support housing, it makes me happy. And I was uh, pleased to serve on the advisory um, panel that uh, the Treasurer and his office set up to review these projects and support all, all three of these, these uh, investments. Uh, it's going to result in a lot of new housing across a broad spectrum of need um, and a lot of creative new, new tools and projects presented there. Um, I want to say that uh, for right now, I want to put another plug for an existing program for flood impacted uh, renters, the BGAP, the Vermont Business Assistance Grant Program. Remind folks in, in, the, in the media here, ask you, you know, spread the word. Um, landlords are businesses. There is money available in this fund. It's still accepting applications on a rolling basis. And this money can help repair your apartments to get people back into them if they've been damaged by the flood. So please, please submit your applications to that program. Reach out for help. Um, the, the money's uh, approved on a rolling basis, and there's still funds available. Um, with that, I'd just like to say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, been an honor to, to be working with the housing partners up here and the governor um, and, and serving in this role. And, um, you know, more housing opportunity, more housing choice um, is what Vermont's future needs. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, before opening it up to questions, I just want to remind everyone that this Saturday, We'll be collecting flood-related tires at the Grubery Granite Museum from 8 to 4. So whether you're an individual, a municipality, or a business who has tires found from the floods, you can drop them off and we'll dispose of them at no cost to you. Also, in the uh, good news category, uh, this Saturday at 7 a.m., uh, AOT will be opening up another 20-mile stretch of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail from Cambridge to Wolcott. Uh, this will mean about 73 miles of the 93-mile uh, rail trail will be fully open. So that's uh, really good news. So with that, I'll open up to questions. Governor, uh, Commissioner Pichak, said uh, Vermonters can be assured their tax dollars will be well protected. Some of the state's new housing revolving loan funds supported by our transfer tax payments have an extremely poor record of payback. How will you avoid that? Um, well, we'll do the best uh, best we can, obviously. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the investments are safe. I will probably have uh, Treasurer Pichak answer the rest of that, but um, we'll all work on this together. Yeah, thanks, Governor. So it's a good question. I mean, obviously, from our perspective, this pot of money has a lot of flexibility, but uh, it needs to be paid back. That's our most important item. So the partners that we uh, decide to partner with um, all have strong balance sheets. They're all providing guarantees for the projects. Um, in, some, in one instance, at least, the project itself will have a lien on it. So the projects will be well secured, either from the balance sheets of the organizations or from the specific projects themselves. Okay. Um, Maura, you said that your organization is going to be uh, awarding the loans, but it sounds like there's already some sense of very specific projects that are going to be getting this money. So I'm wondering how we can know with such confidence that these projects are going to be funded if you have yet to go through that process. Fair question. Uh, first off, I was invited to speak today, but I just want to point out that we have the executive director of VITA here, as well as the um, Northern Forest Center, who also were funded through this project. So those are some specific projects. Also, as you can imagine, in the past year, the affordable housing developments, costs have gone up 34%. 
And so what we have is a pipeline of projects that are just waiting to fill in those gaps of funding so that they can move forward. These are oftentimes fully permitted, already designed and approved properties that because of cost escalation, now they just need a little bit of money to move forward. So we're looking at that kind of pipeline to know example projects. Additionally, there are other projects that may be a little farther out and have some of their funding, but not all their funding, and they're looking at needing more resources, and um, so that's part of the pipeline that we're considering. But then there's other projects that are new and emerging and we don't know yet, and so there is an open call to say that we're going to be publicly announcing this money and these programs, and so we do welcome. It's not that there is um, all the money is spoken for already. There is a bit, and especially the treasurer, I think, wisely encouraged us to set aside the six million for the flood response, not knowing it exactly how much the income, um, the insurance proceeds are going to come up with, or the FEMA resources are going to be able to provide. And so some of this money will be able to fill those gaps that are still unknown. So the confidence comes from the pipeline that we know about, which is pretty robust, as well as knowing that um, we, the meeting to um, make this award was a public meeting held on Friday, and over the weekend our office got six phone calls from developers and builders who had somehow heard about it before even this press conference. So I think that uh, the interest is really there, and we all know that the need is there. How did we land on the 1100 number in terms of units? Like, what, what went into that, that calculation? So I'll, I'll just, you know, Part of it was an estimate from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and then combined with the, the specific projects, uh, the Vita project that will add 65 beds and the Northern Forest project that will add nine. So the thousand or so that uh, more referenced uh, is an estimate of what they think they'll be able to support, not just with the 55 million, but with the 55 million, plus the hundreds of millions of additional capital, uh, that together will support uh, the, uh, the uh, thousand units uh, from BHFA's estimate. And you, you mentioned that these might be low interest loans. Do you have a, a sense of what that rate might be? Yeah, for sure. So it depends on the duration. But for example, a lot of these loans are less than 20 years. So if you're taking a loan for 20 years, the interest rate would be 2%. If the loan were less than five years, it would be 1%. So it's a, a, it's a flexible rate based on how long you're, you're, you're taking out the loan. But that is the critical piece here, uh, is the low interest rate. Uh, that's the part that will help drive down the 30% plus increase in costs uh, will be providing low cost capital to these projects. Go ahead, Martin. If I may, um, those interest rates that the treasurer just quoted were the interest rates that VHFA will be paying um, on the state's deposits back to the treasurer's office. But the actual interest rates that developers get could be very different. Uh, for we're trying to blend in other public and private resources and so that's what the state is getting in terms of an interest rate but not necessarily what developers are getting I would still anticipate that loans to developers would um, be below three to four percent though um, so the investment advisory committee signed off on this lump sum of fifty million dollars and said, and here are the buckets we want that money allocated to. And then now it's up to the HFA to decide where precisely that, that money will be awarded. Yeah, I think that, that's right, uh, Peter. So we, we asked for applications back in June. Um, you know, we received 40 plus applications that all had uh, various ways that they planned on investing the money. Some of them were direct projects, some of them were projects that were indirect. So like VHFA, they would take money and then invest it directly. We, um, you know, in terms of the vast majority of the money in this uh, pot, uh, focused on those entities that had the specific expertise to be able to find uh, projects that would have the biggest impact and the biggest need, but also to be able to leverage the additional funds uh, to make the biggest impact. So that was the strategy for this first round of announcements. Uh, the LIAC committee does make recommendations. Ultimately, it's the treasurer's office who's responsible for making the final decision on uh, which projects get funded. Uh, and will there be some kind of but for test, Laura, where you'll have to determine that if not for this loan, this project won't go forward? Is that like that is what we've done for the last 50 years, yes. Um, we always look and try to braid together resources. So while this $50 million will support about 1,000 homes, 
if you do the math of a per unit investment, that doesn't make affordable housing on its own. So what we need to do is we take, we would take with that about 125 million of other public resources through the state or through the federal government, as well as we anticipate about 175 million of private dollars. And together, this is gonna support about $325 million of uh, economic activity, which will support Vermont's communities. And so we always look to see how to best and most efficiently braid that money together. Where do we, where can there be private investments, like from employers we see more and more stepping up to want to contribute to housing? Where do we need our partners, like the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board that receives state dollars? And where does that come in? And then where can other, um, federal tax credits and other public programs also support this. It all comes together. And so that's why I think it's important to know that all these programs get very complicated very quickly. And so I appreciated Mr. Page's question about the repayment of these. These will be amortizing loans that do get paid back and VHFA is putting its balance sheet behind guaranteeing that repayment. But there are other types of public programs that um, have different models, like 0% uh, silent second loans, we call them, where um, they are investments that are very much secure and still invested publicly, um, but don't have that, aren't built upon that same kind of repayment model that this program's built on. And when you're building affordable housing, when you're building any kind of housing, it's very expensive, and so you have to layer all these things together to make it work overall. Treasurer, can you explain in layman's terms um, what is cash on hand? Why do we have more of it right now? And why is it money we're able to loan out? Yeah, for sure. So when this project, when this program was originally created back in like 2014, 2015, the state on average would have maybe 200, 300, 400 million dollars sort of in its bank account, if you will. So this is money that's been appropriated or will be appropriated in the next year. Uh, but it has not yet been spent. So it's being, uh, it's, it's either waiting to be spent or waiting to be appropriated. So since the pandemic, there's been a dramatic increase. Our uh, cash on hand this morning, for example, was over 2.1 billion. And it generally has sat over $2 billion for the last, um, you know, two years or so. A lot of that is federal money that has come in, uh, but also a lot of it is increased state revenues. The budgets are bigger in the last few years. That means there's more money to appropriate and there's a longer time until it's spent. So we anticipate um, you know, the cash on hand being uh, pretty significant for the foreseeable future. We don't know if it'll be $2 billion. Um, you know, that would mean that uh, we would have even more money to invest, but we took a conservative approach um, knowing that we could reasonably expand the program up to $100 million um, and have this money available today uh, to do investment. Recently, uh, there were folks here in Vermont that were assessing our credit rating, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Has, has our housing crisis or the housing crunch, has that had any effect on how some of the credit folks are, are looking at our state? Well, you know, whether it was our one-on-one -on -one meetings with the governor and myself with the credit rating agencies or it was the day that we spent in Vermont with them, uh, you know, housing was like the number one issue. When we talked about um, the venture capital investment that's been made in Vermont at Hula with a bunch of venture capital principles. You know, housing uh, was the issue that came up time and again in terms of the issue holding back the businesses to grow even more. Uh, similarly, when we were talking about advanced manufacturing, you know, housing was the critical issue. Beta Technologies, Global Foundries, they're all struggling uh, with housing. And even when we had a specific housing related discussion, we invited employers that you know, are trying to be creative and building their own housing uh, for individuals. So I think the message was quite clear that there's, a, there's been a strong demand to move to Vermont, that that demand continues, but that we're restrained in our growth uh, by our housing stock. So that's reflected in their rating reports when they say, you know, Vermont has seen demographic changes and that's a good thing, but we want to see that continue. Uh, we want to see the population continue to grow and get younger and have a, a younger workforce, but that can only happen if we have more housing. Uh, we still were rated, uh, you know, double A plus, which is the second highest rating, uh, and had, um, you know, a really favorable visit with them overall. Oh, Thank Senator Ramizzo, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. I, oh, has the governor not spoken? No, no. Oh, Go ahead. okay. 
gosh, I thought there was there was a Q and A. We would love to have you say a few words okay. if you like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just took every back road between here and Basin Harbor uh, to be here, so that doesn't mean you have to quote me, um, but <laughs> it's just really, I would go anywhere in the state and stand with almost anybody, and particularly our governor, Commissioner Hanford, who is, it's going to be a huge loss for the state when he leaves, um, to push for more housing in the state. And in fact, I just left um, the Vermont Lodging Association's meeting where we heard from uh, hotel owners and, and lodging facilities that they are using some of their hotel rooms and otherwise rooms that would go to tourists to house their own staff because they are simply at the end of their capacity um, to hire people otherwise. I uh, thought I was coming at the tail end just to say that the legislature has a very unique role to play in making sure that this money that's being invested is actually well spent. Um, we need to get regulatory barriers and hurdles out of the way. Uh, we need to make sure people have certainty and they know the timeline on which they can build a project because otherwise we lose a lot of money to litigation and to that uncertainty and to project delays and that is not a good use of taxpayer dollars. Um, that is not what people should be paying for and some of that burden goes on our lowest income earners who then end up having to pay more to access that housing or we're unable to build as much housing as we need uh, given the great work of our affordable housing partners. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Definitely didn't mean to step in front of the governor. Um, thought we were, we were coming to the end. And um, then I go on to the law school where they have an exhibit right now on the color of law. And I teach around issues of inequity related to housing. Um, our, our gap in being able to afford your home is the largest contributor to the, um, the income gap and the wealth gap in this country. And if someone can afford their first home, they can find a place in Vermont and they can gain a foothold in the economy and grow their family and be a strong contributing member of our community. And that is what we should be fighting for. Thank you. I want to reiterate uh, again, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, as I said before, S100 was a critical piece uh, of this and it will be tremendously helpful uh, in the future. We need more regulatory reform, but uh, Senator Rahm Hensdale was an important partner in that uh, passage of S100. So thank you very much. Further so, questions? Yes, yeah, so housing has been obviously a pretty big topic here today. And we have Commissioner Hanford who will be stepping down at the end of September. So I guess, how could that possibly affect this program or just housing going forward as it is a pretty pressing issue not to have a commissioner at the end of September to kind of overseeing everything? Well, we, we will have a commissioner. We'll have an acting commissioner uh, at this at this point in time. And um, while we, you know, we rely on Josh a lot and he's been uh, a great partner, a great member of our team, and we're going to miss him. Uh, but he's not going far uh, with him going to VLCT. Uh, he will be helpful in that regard as well. But uh, we will we will do our best to backfill, fill his shoes, uh, so to speak, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to make sure that housing is a primary focus for us. Would it work more like, say, an interim commissioner come when he's on, or is it going to be somebody full-time? It'll be interim. Governor, switching gears for a second. Um, as you know, UVM Health Network uh, recently wrote a letter to legislators um, highly critical of your appointees to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, how do you respond to that criticism and do you think it's appropriate for these hospital officials to be writing such a letter near a critical budget vote? Well, again, uh, we don't have oversight over the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, this was uh, something the legislature uh, had put forward a um, number probably a, maybe a decade ago. and. Um, and I, I do appoint the members of the board after they are fully vetted uh, by another panel. Um, and I have confidence in their ability to, to work their way through this process. Uh, they're the ones who have oversight. Uh, and this is critical. I mean, this will, their, their budgets will have an impact on Vermonters every day, everyday Vermonters. And uh, so uh, they have a role to play, and we'll see how it all um, uh, that's out, and uh, but they're they're doing their job. And um, 
switching gears again. Across the country, um, there's debates going on politically about whether uh, former President Donald Trump should be able to run again due to the 14th Amendment. Um, where do you weigh in on, on that debate? Yeah, I think we have to be careful in some respects. Um, we don't want to impose a restriction for someone who is accused. Um, we'll see how that all works out, and we'll let the courts figure that out as well. Uh, but, um, but obviously, I'm not a supporter of uh, former President Trump. Um, but at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that we continue to be um, a democracy uh, that respects the rule of law. And uh, and he is accused, but um, but he hasn't been he hasn't been tried and uh, and adjudicated. Thank you. We have a few folks on the phones, then we can come back to the room. We'll start with Keith, the Rotten Herald. I uh, have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, Devin, are there, there has been some talk about maybe reinstituting any um, COVID mask or other mitigation because of the increase over the summer. It's kind of subsided, as you know, the last couple of weeks, but it, is that something that, that you would, that you could be on the table going forward if things get worse during the winter? Um, we believe we went through the pandemic. Uh, we've been through a number of flu seasons. Uh, this um, COVID has, uh, I guess, transformed into more of a flu-like um, symptom. And, uh, and disease. So we, uh, we feel uh, that people should take it upon themselves. They know what to do to protect themselves. If they choose to wear a mask, they should. If that's what they should do if they want to. Uh, and uh, just take all the precautions we, we talked about during the pandemic. Uh, you know, get your, get your flu shot, get your, your COVID shot, uh, your vac vaccinations. Um, wash your hands, uh, keep, a, keep a distance uh, during, during this season, and, uh, and wear a mask if you choose to. Uh, but, uh, but if there's talk of, um, of imposing uh, a mask mandate, uh, that's not coming from us. Are you planning to get the, uh, the new booster? It's just about available now. I, I am. Um, when I, I want to make sure that I can get I'd like to get them at the same time, so I, I need to weigh that out. Uh, I think there's a, um, I may wait for the next, the next version. Okay. All right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, you started this press conference talking about the need for uh, more regulatory help to help, help us increase the speed uh, and timing of which we can increase the housing. What are the top things that you would like to see accomplished at the legislature that would be added to S-100 or a new bill? Well, we have had uh, many suggestions uh, we've, we've put forward in uh, legislation over the last seven years. I would say dust off almost any of them, uh, and uh, I think that would be, be helpful. So we'll, we'll continue to work with the legislature. Uh, I know Senator Ram Hizel has, uh, has said uh, that this is a priority for their committee as well. So we'll work together and try to, to adopt something that works for everyone. because. It, you know, when you look at what we're here for today, <clears throat> the $50 million here, the $37 million we put forth uh, to begin with, all of the money, the hundreds of millions of dollars, both of these programs uh, did uh, leverage and will leverage, uh, plus the $250 million that we put forth uh, out of ARPA money, uh, and all that will leverage. It would be a travesty for us to be held up um, by regulatory reform that is just redundant. And so uh, trying to find uh, ways to get through that redundancy uh, is, uh, is something that's a priority for me, um, but I believe for many legislators as well. Will you and your team uh, be putting together a specific list for the legislature that you'd like to see them accomplish in a bill? Yes. 
Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. To the room. Off of that, that last question, Governor, you and your team have been pushing for exemptions in downtowns and urban areas, but as we know, many of them are in the floodplain or next to rivers. Given this flood, I mean, is, is this making you rethink of, of where you'd like to see Act 250 exemptions? Well, we had asked uh, originally, uh, we had asked for exemptions throughout. Uh, I think the final version, it came down to some of the more downtown areas. And, uh, and I still think there's a role to play for the downtown areas. Not every downtown, uh, although many of them are in floodways, uh, but not all of them. Um, so, and there's ways to mitigate that as well. And those are the conversations we're going to have over the next few months, both with FEMA and legislators and communities about how do we become more resilient? How do we mitigate? Uh, and from, and I've, you've heard me talk about this before, but I think it's all in trying to create more storage capacity for some of the, the, the rainfall uh, that we see, uh, the tremendous storms uh, that we've, we've uh, experienced and we're going to experience more in the future. But how do we store that water uh, while we wait it out? And uh, that's the key. And I think that there is an opportunity uh, here to do, do just that, uh, but also create uh, more housing at the same time. Do you see any of those 1,100 units that we're going to be creating, do you see any of those being specifically earmarked for people who lost their homes during the flood? Um, I don't know. more. Uh, everything's on the table right now, but I also want to be honest that someone who may have been living in a manufactured home who didn't have a mortgage doesn't want a loan, probably, in order to uh, rebuild their home. It may be necessary, and if they're interested in that, then we'd like to look at what may be possible. But I go back to the idea of needing to braid together resources so that we can really meet the needs that they're at. So yes, that's on the table is something we're looking at. But the actual trying to understand what individuals' needs are and what their financial capacity is to pay back these loans is also going to have to be an important factor. Speaking of uh, displaced Vermonters, Mr. Roy, can you, can you give us a status update on um, your agency's projects related to that? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, right now, we had over 200 uh, uh, people who qualified for assistance from FEMA for direct housing. Uh, those are people whose homes were either destroyed or they met uh, the qualifications of at least $12 per square foot uh, uh, for damages to their home. Uh, based upon that population, uh, FEMA has been calling them and asking them, do they need assistance from us in finding housing uh, for up to 18 months? Uh, and we are at the point where I think we're around 60 some odd people have said, yes, uh, we could use some assistance. And so we're looking at different options. And as we discussed previously, there are three different options that we're looking at. One is, is direct house a lease where we find a location and we lease it for them. The second is uh, finding uh, multi-family uh, properties of at least three um, apartments to be able to repair uh, and lease out. Uh, and then the third option are the, the FEMA mobile homes uh, that uh, many are familiar with. Um, and so based upon the individual's desire and the location they're at, we'll explore what works best for them. Uh, if the answer is the, the mobile home, uh, it will depend on uh, do they have a property that they would like it placed on. Um, so if you were uh, uh, displaced from your home uh, and you're in a floodplain, that's not going to work. But your brother has a location that's close by that you can place uh, a, a unit on. They would offer that up. We would resource the, the spot. And if it's suitable, we would place it there. Uh, and then the, the last option we're talking about is taking a look at group sites. Um, and uh, I think many have, have uh, heard that we're working with Montpelier as a, for a potential site location for that. Um, I think there's a city council meeting this evening. We'll discuss that. If that looks like it's a probable um, location, uh, we'll move forward with uh, exploring that as, as an option. 
the biggest thing we understand is that winter is coming very quickly and we need to move with all speed so that those who have been displaced and need our help are placed uh, in a location that will that they can use up to 18 months until they find a permanent solution thank you sir Do we have any sense of how many people have opted for buyouts? We don't at this point in time. That's a longer process. Uh, I don't think that it would be a significant number now because it, it takes a while. It takes the, the community they're in uh, to, to, to go along with that. It takes them uh, deciding that's what they want to do and it has to be offered and so forth. So I think that's going to be coming in the weeks and months ahead. Yes, sir. Hold true. Okay. Good. Governor, uh, I just wanted to double check some numbers that I believe I heard from from Laura Collins. Building costs up 34% for affordable housing in the last year, and the market rate for a one bedroom apartment $2,500. Can I get that right? And um, I mean, all those, what someone can afford uh, is going to be based on their income. So when I say $2,500 for a one bedroom apartment, that's to say that if you look at the median of what people are earning in Vermont, you know, what they could afford renting a one bedroom apartment. The increase in housing development costs are being driven by uh, material increases labor shortages and i'd say construction delays and that it's taking longer to get housing built and therefore there's longer carrying costs and construction loans have to be out longer and all that and um so we're seeing that as those the time drags on that it increased the costs overall of housing which is why i too will add my voice to the chorus of saying how important s100 was and the partnership between the governor and the legislature to get that done because that should help speed up some of that process which can make housing more affordable apart from the flood why is it taking longer uh, because of um, supply chain interruptions and material delays, we know of a property, um, we cut a ribbon on affordable property up in the islands where it's a age restricted property. So there's two elevators to serve the residents and they had to open the building with just one elevator in place. And there's a um, elevator shaft that is covered up by a locked uh, utility closet door appearing uh, because it took so long and the cost was so much to get that second elevator placed. We're hearing nationally and across New England about long delays in uh, electric transformers and how in New Hampshire I was just with my peer who said that they have more than one property that is fully built able to be occupied but there's no electricity in it because the transformers are taking so long to get to New England and so you add up these things that may not seem like big issues until they are big issues we can't open buildings if we don't have electricity and we can't serve folks especially those with physical needs if we don't have elevators and we could go on and on from there there's been some stabilizing of cost increases that we're starting to hear about um, but we are hoping that that continues um, but everyone I talk to and listen to, no one is expecting a real drop in costs. We're hoping that the escalation slows down. Richard Wabi of the, uh, the contractor says that the legislature's recently passed law requiring uh, licensure for contractors is, is slowing down the, the flood relief work. He was, he was quoted in Vermont Business, I think. You've been in the business. Uh, is anything to that? I think uh, it's more just those uh, workforce challenges that we face uh, pre-pandemic, pre-flood, and uh, still impact us greatly today. So, and that's why the housing is so important. Uh, and when, you know, it's like the the old adage, uh, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know the workforce challenge, uh, the crisis we face. Uh, is impacted by the housing or vice versa and so we need those workers here to build the housing 
but at the same time we need the housing to bring the workers in. So we, uh, we are choosing this path and uh, making sure that we build the housing uh, so that we can welcome more people in. And we will be reaching out, you know, there's, there's, there is an economy of scale when you have so much money going into housing, when you add everything up, there's literally, you know, hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars of housing uh, that we're contemplating here with all the leveraged assets. Um, so that brings opportunity, and it may bring outside contractors from other states in uh, to take advantage of the situation. This morning down in Washington, Senator Sanders and some other representatives and senators introduced legislation to extend the Child Care Stabilization Act, which throughout COVID helped millions of um, parents and their children, along with hundreds of thousands of providers. I guess in the past few years, how has that national piece of legislation helped Vermont? The funding is planned to run out on September 30th. Yeah. How could that impact the state going forward? It has helped us out, and it helped out uh, you know a community that uh, we desperately need. We need more youth. We need, we need more kids and uh, for our schools and for, for our economy. And so um, we, um, we, I think this is going to be an important piece of that. And, and it's been very helpful. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much.